Hey everyone, this is Keith MacArthur from Cure Grin, and I hope you're all enjoying the conference so far. When we reached out and asked the Grin parent community what you wanted to hear about at the conference, one of the things we kept hearing over and over was to learn more about the uh, about what's new in research and, and what's going on. And uh, as you may have heard, some research has slowed down because of COVID, but there's still a lot of great research going on and a lot of great planning for research going on. And today I'm really excited uh, for you to hear about three pieces of, of research that uh, have not been published yet, that they're all sort of in progress. So um, we are going to start today with Dr. Michael Kruer uh, at Phoenix Children's Hospital. And he's going to talk about magnesium as a potential treatment for grin gain of function patients. All right, so so thank you for the, the introduction. Um, everyone, please let me know if you if you can't hear me or if you can't see my slides. Um, but uh, I really appreciate the chance to, to speak to all of you. Um, I'm a, a little bit of, of an outsider uh, to the, the grin world, um, to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm a, a pediatric neurologist and uh, also a molecular geneticist based in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, to, be, to be honest, Grin wasn't really on my radar um, until I met uh, a really exceptional family uh, and uh, an amazing little boy that I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you about this morning. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about intrathecal magnesium for the case of a Grin-1 gain of function. And in this case, uh, I think it's important just to start off uh, with intrathecal being magnesium, uh, as the, the mineral uh, delivered within the, the brain and spinal cord. And so I, I have no disclosures. And just to jump right into things, uh, the little boy that we're talking about was born at term. There were early concerns because of a lack of milestones. He did experience irritability um, and as has already been discussed in the conference, uh, some regression within the, the first months of life. At age six months, he developed infantile spasms, a uh, particularly severe type of seizure syndrome with a characteristic pattern on the EEG called hypsarrhythmia. These spasms were treated with ACTH, uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone, which is a, a common treatment for spasms. And he showed some transient developmental Im improvement uh, as well as a, a cessation of the, the spasms. However, this, uh, this progress seemed to be somewhat transient because he then started to, again, decline uh, along with the emergence of, of generalized seizures. And really on, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, he had very slow motor and language development. He was, was very sleepy much of the time. When he was awake, uh, there was irritability. Uh, his awareness was diminished. He had limited interaction um, and reduced purposeful movement. And so, uh, one of the, the more severe presentations of a, of a grin mutation. Motor-wise, his, his head control was relatively poor. He did not sit, uh, roll, or reach for toys consistently um, at the time that I, I started seeing him. And I got involved as a pediatric movement disorders neurologist uh, and neurogeneticist in particular uh, because he had uh, some abnormal movements. And uh, in, in treating this, this young man, um, a whole host of different therapies were tried, and this included, these included uh, very um, numerous anti-epileptic medications, a vagus nerve stimulator, and at the time of, of the uh, trial that I'm going to be telling you about, uh, his interaction was, was still limited, um, he had a lot of irritability that he experienced, uh, and there were about four to six tonic seizures occurring uh, per day still at that point in time. And so, what, what piqued our interest um, in particular was that the nature of the boy's mutation had been detected um, by whole exome sequencing. Uh, so there was a mutation in, in the GRIN1 gene. Uh, it led, for a, uh, it led to, to an exchange of uh, one amino acid for another, uh, a missense mutation, as you heard about earlier this morning. And this variant uh, was something that was evaluated at the, the Center for Functional Evaluation of, of Rare Variants, which, which many of you in the community are, are aware of. And so in, uh, in Stephen Trainellis' lab, 
uh, Scott Myers and, and colleagues actually characterized the effects of this mutation uh, in the laboratory. And they did this by um, using a cell type, um, Xenopus oocytes or, or frog eggs, and introducing uh, this GRIN1 variant into those cells. And you can kind of think of those cells as, as like an empty room uh, that can be used to, to look at, at activity. And what I hope that you'll notice is that when they, they compared uh, wild type or, or normal um, GLUN1 uh, to, to the effects of this particular variant, they saw differences. And just to, to cut to right, right to the chase, uh, they found that a whole host of, of different properties um, of the, the uh, channel itself really were not affected by, by this um, genetic variant, by this mutation. But they did find uh, that this, this mutant GRIN1 uh, was relatively insensitive to, to magnesium um, on the order of, of sevenfold. And what this would be expected to do uh, was to result in, in uncontrolled activity or activation um, of that NMDA receptor. Uh, and again, this, this uh, data is, is courtesy of um, our colleagues at, at CFIRF. Um, although they shared this data with us, uh, the subsequent clinical decisions that we made uh, were, were made by the team in, in Phoenix alone. And, and so we started to think about this and, and really ask the question as to what effect this seemed to be having. And if you, you think about the, the NMDA receptor at a, at a simple level, um, it, it's kind of like uh, a bathtub with, with, with a, uh, a spout at the bottom or, or a plug. Uh, and, and water or the current, you know, in the form of sodium and calcium ions will flow through uh, freely through this, uh, this, this receptor, this channel. Um, but magnesium acts normally as, as a plug. And with this mutation um, actually affecting the sensitivity of the NMD receptor to, to magnesium, it was predicted to lead to, to current and, and to um, electrical activation, if you will, in an uncontrolled way. And so we started to think about this. And, and initially, uh, the, the first thought that we came up with in, in talking to the family and, and some colleagues was that uh, perhaps we might just try something as, as simple as, as magnesium. Uh, and this could be available potentially from uh, your local pharmacy. Uh, however, when we started to really delve into the literature, uh, we found that there were studies that had looked at this. And there were a number of studies that had shown that taking magnesium orally or by mouth really didn't seem to affect the amount of magnesium within the brain and the spinal cord um, to a great extent. And, and what's more, we came across this paper, uh, which was published in the British Journal of Anesthesia, where they showed um, that cerebral spinal fluid levels, the, the fluid that surrounds the brain and spinal cord, um, the, the levels of magnesium didn't change um, in patients that were given high dose magnesium infusions uh, through, through the veins. And so what this really suggested was that even pumping a person's body full of magnesium uh, through an IV might not be enough to actually cause a substantial change in, in cerebral spinal fluid levels. Um, and might not be uh, enough to make a change at, at the level of the brain. And so prompted by, by discussions with, with the family, uh, for, to, for whom I give a lot of credit for, for helping this, this work move forward, we started to think about the possibility of actually delivering this medication within the, the brain and spinal cord. Um, and this so-called intrathecal administration uh, was something that, uh, that we started to, to seriously discuss. In fact, this has, is done uh, in clinical practice um, during spinal anesthesia. It, it's given um, for pain control. There have been other um, applications. Neurosurgeons have used um, magnesium infusions uh, into the central nervous system, uh, into the, the cerebral spinal fluid uh, for patients with subarachnoid hemorrhages. And so this had been done um, you know, for, for some time and, and had been done relatively safely. Uh, and so what we ended up doing was, was discussing this extensively with uh, our institutional review board, um, the, the ethics committee, if you will, at Phoenix Children's. Um, it was uh, decided that this was not research. This was really off-label treatment. It was using something that, that is used for other purposes, uh, potentially for, for GRIN1. And so this is uh, our little guy here, um, admitted at the beginning of the process after having 
uh, a catheter placed into uh, the, the spinal column to allow the administration uh, of magnesium directly into the spinal fluid that, that bathes the brain and spinal cord. Um, and this is him after he was admitted to the pediatric intensive care unit. Um, and we hooked him up to a, a whole bunch of different monitoring devices, both standard monitoring devices, as well as um, intensive neurophysiologic monitoring devices that allowed us to look at a whole host of different body functions uh, while we actually proceeded with, with this trial. And so essentially what, what we had here is um, something that, that is sometimes discussed in a, a rare disease context, uh, an N of one trial design. And so you can see my, my fellow at the time, Dr. Jennifer Heim, uh, as well as visiting Fulbright fellow, uh, Dr. Michael Fahey there in the picture, but um, we adopted kind of a bedside vigil and after carefully designing this study, uh, we implemented this, this N of one protocol where for the first day, we just collected baseline data. We just looked to see at normal brain function collected through this intensive monitoring uh, to get a sense of how our young patient was doing to start. Um, the next day, we in introduced and initiated this intrathecal magnesium infusion. And the amount of magnesium that we infused was calculated in a dose escalation um, fashion. So we gave a low dose and then a slightly higher dose and a slightly higher dose. On the third day, we, we actually um, allowed him to recover completely, but, but um, did a, a monitor ketamine infusion as well, which I don't have time to tell you about. And the fourth day, he went home. So overall, uh, I would say that, that this, this protocol was, was actually um, pretty well tolerated by, by our patient. Um, although at the high, after the highest doses, um, of the, the intrathecal magnesium, uh, our patient did develop lower blood pressures. Um, they dropped as, as low as 35 for the mean arterial pressures, and that, that did require some intervention uh, from our intensive care team. So I'm, I'm very glad that we had, had taken those, those precautions. But fortunately, uh, his blood pressures rebounded quickly, and um, he recovered, and then the infusion uh, effects started to, to wash out. So the fundamental question, did, did it work? Well, I'll, I'll show you the data that we have. And, and um, it, it's not such a simple question after all uh, because of you know, how profoundly his GRIN1 mutation um, affected him in the beginning. But uh, you guys can make up your minds for yourselves. First question we came across is, were we able to actually increase the concentration of magnesium that was present in the cerebral spinal fluid? And so we were able to measure this through a technique called inductively coupled mass spectrometry uh, with the help of our colleague Ning Ning Zhao at the University of Arizona. We looked at CSF samples from um, unrelated controls. These are, are different patients who don't have GRIN1 and uh, their CSF was collected for different reasons, but we found that the average magnesium concentration to start was around 30, give or take. Uh, for our little guy, we noticed uh, that his was also around 30. Um, the day before we, we started this protocol. Um, and then we, we checked a, a baseline uh, and found it was a little bit lower on the, the day of uh, administration when we started to actually give the intrathecal magnesium. So the protocol worked that each time uh, we would withdraw a small amount of cerebral spinal fluid uh, from the catheter, um, taking great care to keep it, keep it sterile um, and, and keep unnecessary people out of the room. And then after that, we administered doses of magnesium as a slow push. And so you can see that he started roughly around 30. And then we waited about an hour uh, before doing the, the next um, infusion. So we gave a 50 milligram infusion, and then the concentration went up. We gave a 100 milligram infusion the next time, and the concentration went up further, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, as we gave the 200 milligram uh, infusion right around uh, 1.30 in the afternoon, uh, we then noticed that there was a, a peak effect uh, right around uh, 2.30 in the afternoon. And if you look um, at where we started from compared to where we ended up, uh, we significantly increased the concentration of magnesium uh, within the cerebral spinal fluid, um, more so than we had even calculated um, based upon what was mostly adult data. So this, this was really um, some very interesting findings. We, we think that this, this very high level may have been associated with um, some of the drops in mean arterial pressure. Um, but fortunately, 
Soon after uh, stopping the infusions, our patients' uh, intrathecal magnesium uh, concentration started to drop. Um, and by uh, the next morning, they were completely back to normal. So if, if you guys can, can see this, this, this is a measure of spike density. And so one of the, the issues that our patient dealt with were frequent seizures. Um, but the number of seizures could actually vary you know, quite a bit from, from day to day. And so that wasn't a, a very sensitive measure uh, to, to really determine if our treatment was working. What we instead did was we looked at the, the spike um, counts. And so the monitoring system that we used counted the number of epileptiform spikes, the, the number of little um, blips, if you will, that were seizure-like. Um, and what we were able to do was count the number of events that happened um, within a given time interval. Uh, there were usually uh, over 400 uh, different little time sections or epics that we, we counted. Um, and as you can see, the blue shows us on the day prior to treatment. So this is just at his baseline. Um, you can see that over the course of different times of day, there's a bit of fluctuation in how spiky or how epilepsy prone his brain looks. Um, but he has over 100 events an hour and some hours um, over, uh, over 200 events. Uh, then if you look at post-treatment, uh, even with the very lowest dose of intrathecal magnesium, we were able to significantly drop the number of spikes or the uh, propensity for seizures um, in his brain. And this showed somewhat of a dose response where this became significantly lower from the baseline at 50 milligrams. At 100 milligrams, we had a little blip, but at 200 milligrams, it had, the spikes had almost completely disappeared um, and they were gone really by the time we got to 300 milligrams. Um, and so clinical neurophysiologists um, will, will sometimes take issue with, with some of these, these measures. Um, they're, they're not perfect, but I think um, taking into account the data for what it is, uh, there's a marked decrease in the number of spikes uh, with the, the intrathecal magnesium treatment. Um, this is uh, a couple of videos, and hopefully you guys are able to see these with, with the connection. But um, to start with, before treatment, uh, this little boy, um, you know, this, this adorable little guy was very, very sleepy. And when he was awake, he was often um, irritable uh, during the, the day, as I remember. Even with attempts to rouse him, it was sometimes difficult to, to get him on very much. Other parts of the day, he was very, as you can see, very fussy. No one liked to be. So this video, in contrast, was taken on the day of treatment, um, and this is at 1:43 p.m. in the afternoon, just after. 300 milligrams of the intrathecal magnesium infusion. And oh, Dr. Hewer, I think we're having trouble hearing you uh, over the video. It might just be taking up too much bandwidth. Hopefully you can see that he's more awake. He's making better eye contact with his parents. He's responding to their voices. And these things are difficult to quantify. Um, but we wanted to show the videos because it was our impression there was a qualitative um, for this. So um, I, I think uh, Dr. key question. Dr. Hewer, I just, I just wanted to let you know that um, while the video was playing, it was hard to hear you speaking. I think it was just all using up too much bandwidth. So um, if, if there's anything you, you just want to repeat um, during that last video, especially, that would be great. Sure, sure. So, so um, I, I will say that uh, I think the videos are, are qualitative. It, it's difficult to um, collect data or numbers um, on on some of these things, uh, like level of alertness, for example. Uh, but hopefully, the the videos were able to show you at least representatively um, before treatment compared to after treatment uh, what what some of the the qualitative aspects of, of his response were. Um, and and as far as his questions go, uh, I, I think a whole host of questions remain. 
One is number one, did, did it work? I mean, I, I think we were able to, um, you know, diminish the amount of um, epilepsy prone um, spikes that we saw on the EEG. Um, and this was, was highly statistically significant. Uh, but, but what does that translate to in terms of, of meaning and in terms of, of quality of life? Um, I, I think that, that that's a huge question. Uh, this, this boy was significantly developmentally delayed. And although we, we saw some potential benefits during the time of treatment, um, what would that translate into to long term? Um, another question that the goal CSF concentration, uh, it seemed at least based upon the response and the, the clinical and neurophysiologic data that we collected, it was about three times normal. So can that be sustained without side effects? Um, again, we were pumping this medication in um, as, as boluses or, or um, lump treatments. Uh, but it, 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 as you saw, the levels of CSF magnesium, uh, once treatment was stopped, they went down quickly. So is, is this something that, that can be sustained? Because in essence, we were working against the normal mechanisms of his body. Um, his body doesn't realize that it has a, a GRIN1 mutation. Um, it tries to maintain a normal level of, of magnesium um, at, at all times. And so we're working against that in order to try to control the effects of the GRIN1 mutation. Um, fundamentally, is intrathecal magnesium, it's obviously invasive. Uh, th this was something very out of the box, um, but something that after careful discussion with the family and with, with an entire team of experts coming together, we thought was was worth a worth a try for for this young man. Um, is it any better than, than ketamine or other anti-epileptics? And I, I think that's that's a difficult question to to answer. Um, although uh, our our data analysis is is still ongoing. Um, so with that, I'd be uh, I just want to say thanks uh, to Brian Apabu, the epileptologist in the study, Ning Ning Zhao, who helped with the uh, mass spec measurements of, of manganese, Sean Gamble. Uh, phenomenal pediatric anesthesiologist that, that made this, this intrathecal trial possible, um, as well as my, my lab team, uh, including Sheetal Shetty, who spearheaded the data analysis, supported by Sarah Lewis, and uh, Jen Heim, who was my, my clinical fellow. Um, finally, uh, I have just had the great pleasure of working with an absolutely amazing family whose dedication to, to their son is, is just unmatched. Um, and it, it, it's been humbling to, to work work with them. Um, but uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the, the next presenters. Thank you. Yeah, so just a reminder, if you've got questions, put them up in the Q&A in your screen. And uh, if we have time at the end of the session, we'll get to them otherwise at the end of the day. But our next speaker, I'm, I'm excited to introduce uh, Dr. Patrick Tidball at the University of Toronto. Um, he's a last minute replacement for Dr. Colin Ridge, who wasn't able to make it, but um, I think he's even more intimate, uh, has even more intimate knowledge with this, this research is more directly involved in, in um, conducting that, that experiment. So uh, we're so glad to have you, Patrick, over to you. Okay, um, thanks, Keith. I hope you can all uh, hear me okay. Um, so, so yeah, I'll be talking about some uh, early results that we've been getting uh, characterizing uh, synaptic transmission, synaptic plasticity in a in a mice model of RIN1 uh, G620R. Um, so Keith's just told me that actually nine patients have been identified with this specific uh, variant now. Um, so that's the importance of, of this kind of work in mice. Um, hide that. Okay, so just to talk about the mice uh, briefly, there's quite a lot to get through, so I might have to rush a little bit, um, but uh, hopefully it all makes sense. Um, so these mice were generated using the CRISPR technique um, and to introduce a single um, change in the genetic code of the GRIN1 gene, um, so specifically at 18, position 1858, um, a G is changed to a C. Um, in the human the patients, this can also be changed to an A um, nucleotide. Um, but the, the resulting amino acid change is the same in both cases, so glycine is changed to an R arginine at position 620 which is here in the M2 loop, which is part of the pore forming region. Um, so this can affect things like iron permeation and magnesium sensitivity potentially. Um, so we haven't done any kind of rigorous characterization of, of the of behavior or of the mice themselves, but just to mention as a point of interest, um, we do find that the anecdotally that the heterozygous mice tend to be 
um, smaller than their wild type litter mates. So the heterozygous mice have one copy of the variant gene, one copy of the wild type gene, and the, the wild type mice have two copies. And another point of interest is in our breeding pairs. So we put uh, two, like a male and a female heterozygous mice together as breeding pairs. Um, so far, we haven't found any homozygous mice being born. So this suggests to us we're still looking, um, but this suggests that the um, having two copies of the variant allele may be embryonically uh, lethal. Um, so just to talk about the methodology quickly. So the, the experiments we do uh, in the lab uh, primarily is uh, electrophysiological recordings from hippocampal slices. That's recording the electrical signals um, from brain slices. So the hippocampus is this part of the brain. Um, in, in this is a, an MRI scan of a, a rat brain, but mouse brains are very pretty much the same. Um, so this just illustrates where the slices come from. So we make thin slices and we can keep them alive in a physiological solution um, to keep the cells alive. And we can stimulate a, a, this synaptic pathway called the collateral pathway with a stimulating electrode and record the a corresponding synaptic re responses using a recording electrode. And so there are two types of responses I'll be showing today primarily. Um, so one is an amperoceptor mediated response, which looks like this. So if you look at the uh, schematic of the glutamate synapse, so the amperoceptors are represented by these um, yellow receptors here. So under, under physiological conditions, and that is to say one millimolar magnesium in our recording conditions, uh, the NMDA receptors shown in red are blocked by magnesium. So all the response comes from the amperoceptors. And we can see this is the case. So when we apply a selective antagonist of amperoceptors, this response goes away completely. And then to look at the NMDA receptor mediated response, we first block the uh, amperoceptors with MBQX and we lower the magnesium concentration to relieve this magnesium block. And then we can record um, an NMDA receptor mediated response as well. So we can compare these two responses. Okay, so on to some uh, data. And so one of the first things we wanted to look at is just basal synaptic transmission um, mediated by amper receptors and compare that between the wild type mice and the heterozygote mice. So just, yeah, so I forgot to mention that all the comparisons I'm making here are between the heterozygous mice containing one copy of the G620R variant allele and their, and their wild type litter mates. Um, so to look at basal synaptic transmission, we do what's called an input output curve, where we vary the stimulation of the intensity to record synaptic responses of different uh, sizes and we can plot the presynaptic activation against the synaptic response, and this gives us a measure of, of synaptic strength. So what you're looking at here is the data from the wild-type mice. If I add on the heterozygous mice, which I'll be showing in blue, um, we see there's actually no difference at all in the amperoceptor mediated transmission. Um, and just as a, an, an aside, really, we also want to do more kind of imaging type studies, looking at brain anatomy and neuron number and that kind of thing. This is a very uh, preliminary um, image is just we just did this just the other week. Um, just but this is nissel staining, so looking at staining specifically the neurons in, in the in the hippocampus here, and we find um, uh, at least visually there doesn't appear to be any difference really in terms of gross anatomy or neuron number. So the uh, take home message from all of this is that basal synaptic transmission mediated by amperoceptors and gross brain anatomy are similar in the heterozygous mice and the wild type mice which suggests that the, the, the heterozygous mice don't have any significant deficits in terms of uh, high-level brain development and neuron number and synaptic connectivity, at least in the hippocampus. Um, this may be applicable to, to the rest of the brain as well. Um, okay, so we can do the same test for, for synaptic transmission, but this time looking at NMDA receptor responses. And here we uh, do see a difference. And so we find that in the heterozygous mice, there's a significantly reduced uh, level of NMDA receptor mediated transmission. And we can also look at this in a slightly different way, but it's essentially the same result, looking at the ratio of the amperoceptor mediated response to the NMDA receptor mediated response in the same slice. In the wild types, this is what it looks like. And obviously, visually, you can very clearly see that relative to the amperoceptor response, the NMDA receptor response is very much reduced in the heterozygotes. Um, so, there are, uh, we think there are really two main possibilities to explain this reduced NMDA receptor mediated response. One is that there are simply fewer receptors at synapses, 
but that they uh, contain primarily the wild type gluon 1 subunit. Or alternatively, there could be a similar number of, of receptors, but some proportion of them contain the variant subunit, um, which somehow changes receptor function and reduces the current passing through the receptor. Um, so one thing we're doing to address this is look at protein levels. So, so far, we've only looked at total protein, and we found there's no difference in the hippocampus of the wild-type mice and the heterozygous mice. So this suggests there's no uh, deficiency in, in producing the protein subunit or the gluon one subunit itself from the DNA. Um, but we want to go on to look at cell surface and synaptic expression of gluon one as well. This will tell us if there's any kind of trafficking deficiency to the synapses, which we suspect there probably is. Um, and so something else we can uh, we, we looked at is that we know so from uh, literature, so I think it's from ST Train analysis group, um, that in, if you express the variant receptor in a recombinant system, so Xenopazusai, uh, with either GLUN2A or GLUN2B, there's a, reduce, a reduction in the magnesium block, so a change in the sensitivity to magnesium. We can use this to, um, to ask whether uh, option two might be the case, because if the variant receptor or subunit is incorporated into functional receptors, we might expect to see a different in magnesium sensitivity in the heterozygous mice on NMDA receptor-mediated responses. So we've done the experiment and we found that there's actually no difference at all in magnesium sensitivity. And this is, again, early. We need to repeat this a little bit, but it's, uh, it looks pretty solid. But there's no difference um, in magnesium sensitivity. So we think the most likely scenario at this stage is that um, there's probably a reduced um, number of NMDA receptors at synapses is the most likely reason for the reduced NMDA receptor response. But that these, these receptors, these functional receptors, contain the wild type GLUN1, and the likely scenario is that the receptors containing the variant GLUN1 probably don't get to the synapses. And that's just a hypothesis at the moment, so a bit more testing is required. Hey, hey Patrick, I just want to jump in. I want to make sure we have time for Dr. Hudik's talk. So. Sure, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, three minutes. I'll, wrap, I'll wrap it up in, in a 30 seconds or so. Okay. I'm going to go through this, but just to mention, so we've looked at synaptic plasticity in the form of long-term potentiation. If you go to the NMDA receptor session, Graham or John will be talking about this in more detail. Um, but um, just to mention that we found a, a difference in synaptic plasticity, so it's a, it's a lower level in the heterozygous mice, um, and uh, we can use this assay to test Drugs, but we can maybe talk about this another time. So we tested memantine, we tested D-cycloserine, we found there's no, no improvement to the, the LTP uh, deficit in with these drugs so far. And um, I'll skip the summary, I think, and, and let you move on to the next slide. Or just to say uh, thanks to the, to the work as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so finally, Dr. Caitlin Hudick of the University of Alabama. Um, she got a grant from the Grin 2B Foundation to help uh, with her research, and she's going to be talking to us about uh, searching for a Grin 2B biomarker. Let's start at the very beginning. Thanks, everyone. Um, very excited to be here, um, and I'll try to be quick as well so we can have some time for questions. Um, so I am a psychologist, which is uh, a very different kind of perspective, but um, what I want to do is give you a little taste of, of what we're doing to kind of map between what we see in children on a day-to-day -day basis to what uh, the genetics look like. Um, at, at, and I've been scribbling lots of notes from our previous speakers. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why we think brain biomarkers might be very important and give you a little taste of um, an early biomarker of attention we see in grin 2 b So I think that it's pretty clear through a lot of the speakers today that all of our goals is really to think about how we can improve the lives of our kids with grin mutations um, and, and family life. And we have a lot of different ways to do that, right? So we have therapies that might in involve pharmacology, it might involve um, um, kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, um, therapeutic conversations, OTPT. So we have a lot of different ways to get to this improvement. Um, and sometimes it's hard to know what is the best strategy to take. So one of the, um, some of the work that I did in my postdoc a couple of years ago is really to start thinking about not just things at either the genetic level um, or this diagnostic level, but to really start to think about how all of these different pieces play together. So 
Um, we've just heard some amazing talks talking more specifically. Oops, and this, that's a typo. This is a carryover from another talk. But um, so we've, we, we know a lot about what's happening at the genetic level. And um, we can work in the lab with these different models to think about how things are, are sh um, changing at the cellular and synaptic level. Um, and then we can look also and say, well, what are the common problems that we see in our kiddos with grin 2 b um, And um, from the work that we've done, we've seen a lot of um, um, uh, autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability, motor delay, speech delay as some potential targets, right, for treatment. Um, and a lot of the work that we have done has been specifically to understand the autism phenotypes. I wanted to present some new data we have. So we've been looking at kids that have grin 2 b mutations, but then children that have other mutations as well. Um, and, and this is a very complicated figure, but I wanted to show you this because we can look at a lot of different um, item levels and understand where there might be strengths. So the areas in which these little green um, triangles, which are, are grin kids, are closer to the center of the circle indicates areas in which they do not necessarily have um, as many endorsed problems as some of our other children with autism or other mutations. And um, so we can kind of pinpoint a couple of pieces. So we do see that there tends to be um, some areas where we are seeing some more repetitive behaviors in grin 2 b but we also have this really amazing strength of um, the fact that these kids with grin 2 b are just so socially engaged and excited to be with other people. And that's an amazing thing to see, um, particularly considering the fact that we, we are, we know that grin 2 b is associated with autism, but they have these tremendous social strengths. Um, and this is just another way that we've, we've highlighted that. So what our job is, is to try to think about, well, what's missing here? So we can look at the, the cellular level, and then we can look at the behaviors that we're diagnosing at this kind of overall level. And so what our job is in the lab is to think about um, brain biological biomarkers. So what can we measure um, in our, our kids to understand either how well therapy might be going or what therapies might be best suited for each kid. So why EEG? Um, so that's the, the technology that I use. And um, we're not going to dig into the specifics, but clearly there's a, a tremendous role for grin to be in brain development and particularly how it's modulating the synaptic response. Um, the other reason why I think EEG is a tremendous biomarker is because we can use it with all kinds of kids. So we do a lot of work with children who do not have speech, who have speech, who have motor difficulties. Um, as you can see, a lot of my work has also um, been done with babies. Um, and this is a technology that we can use very um, um, readily with these, these individuals. We also can capture these real-time patterns of what is happening at a moment-to-moment -moment level, which is very important, and we'll get to in a minute. So um, I'm not sure that you'll hear me while I play the video, so let me just quickly mention the fact that EEG is a safe and painless procedure, and you can see it goes on in just a, a minute. And so what we're able to do is take each of these different sensors and record that ongoing brain measure. And this is a little bit different than the clinical measures that you might get at the hospital to assess things like seizures and epilepsy, but we are able to capture ongoing states of cognition and then check in about how these are changing over time across um, the experiment. So for in the interest of time, I'm just gonna kind of skip through some of these videos. This shows you how the brain waves look. And here we have a little baby who's doing the session. Um, and I wanted to give you this example from another kid, kiddo um, that we've worked with and to show that it doesn't always go well, but the adaptability of EEG is tremendous. So you'll see um, um, this little um, guy go through a couple different positions. And I, this is kind of like um, the, the highlight reel of, of the tricky times, but this guy did an amazing job. And we were able to, despite the challenges that he was having in the moment, um, and he was testing for about 30 minutes or so, we have a lot of tremendous data. So um, we work with the, each kid to understand kind of where their limits are. Um, and sometimes we stop and try again. Um, and other times it's just, it, 
it, it's okay if, we, if what we get is two minutes of data, we get two minutes of data. So one of the, the um, potential biomarkers that we've been focusing on is this attention mechanism, in part because we can um, relate to um, um, how individuals are learning about the, the environment. And um, so when you first see a new stimulus, there's what we call kind of a pop-out effect where when something doesn't quite fit with other pieces, you our attention system is what's driving us to that. And if I showed you some additional pictures that are very similar, hopefully you're actually getting better and better at picking out where that pop-out effect is. So one of the things that we're tracking is what does the attention system look like overall, but then also how is it changing and are you um, getting better at this response? So from our work in autism, we know that um, we see this larger response in autism and the, the primary biomarker that I'll talk about is this P3A component. So what you can see here is that it's a little bit taller than in our controls. And so what we do is we look at the overall response, which is the red line down here at the bottom. And then we look at all of the times that, inf that children and infants hear these different sounds. And we track how each of those change over time. So this is basically all of those responses um, laid out over the course of the experiment. So we know in autism that this is an enhanced response. And when we look at Grin TV, we actually see that we have an even greater enhanced response to our kids who have autism but do not have a genetic mutation. Um, so you can see that here based on the fact that this negative component is a little bit more negative, And this P3A response, which is, is positive, is a little bit more positive than our autism group. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're looking at these kind of ongoing um, processes over time. And um, so we only have, a, um, I think we have about seven kids right now who've um, been through this study. And so what we're doing is tracking these differences. And we're seeing very little change over time in our grin 2 b group. Um, and it's, these error bars are very large, so we have so few kids. So really what we need to do is get more kids um, into the study. Um, I did want to highlight some of the work being done by our undergraduates, actually. They're, they're, it's been really empowering to work with medical students and have them key in and start to recognize and be engaged about learning about how different um, um, phenotypes look for kids that have mutations. So um, one of the things that they noted in their, their analysis was that our nonverbal IQ seems to have this interesting trend. Um, so... The P3A is not related to verbal IQ, but it might be the case that we have this bigger attention response specifically in the kiddos that have a lower IQ. So lastly, um, I just wanted to kind of plug the work that we're doing. So we are funded by the Grin TV Foundation, and um, we're calling this the Biogene Study, so the Biomarkers of Genetic Etiology of Neurodevelopment. Um, And so our ultimate goal is to find these biomarkers that we can use to develop and test treatments. So to understand the efficacy. So we are currently um, looking for 25 children and um, we are a day or two away from starting before COVID hit. So um, we have some families that um, we're going to hopefully um, We're going to hopefully do a little research road trip in North America. But if any of you out there are a Grin TV family, feel free to reach out to me and um, we'll look into what might be possible. So we're hoping to get this started very soon. And just to kind of give you a quick little preview, um, um, this is me um, dressed up in my bee costume for Grin TV research. So um, I want to thank our, our funding agencies and I'm going to stop here with um, just a brief mention of our contact information so that you can contact me if you are interested in this study. Um, and a big thank you to our families and, and clinical team. And I'm going to go ahead and stop and see if we have time for questions. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time for questions because the next session is about to start. But I do want to thank uh, Dr. Hudik, Dr. Kruer, and Dr. Tibble for these amazing presentations. There's so many great questions in the Q&A. Um, so you guys, I think, can still see them uh, and maybe able to answer them there if that, if that window stays open. I also just want to let everybody else know that now we're going into the breakout sessions. So um, instead of going to the... Uh, main stage. The next sessions are going to be either in the breakout sessions. So in breakout sessions, we have a, a session on GRIN symptoms and the similarities and differences between different types of GRIN disorder. We also have a therapy roundtable with a speech therapist, a physiotherapist, 
um, and a vision specialist. And uh, then in another segment, I think it's going to be in the chats and meetups section, we're having our first sibling chat. So this is a place where siblings of people with grin um, can go and meet with each other in an informal setting. And this first session is designed for teens and adults. So um, thank you all for attending. Thank you guys for those amazing presentations. And uh, we'll see you at the next session.